Hi. OK. So I'm Adam, the co-founder and CTO of SkyMind. Uh, so SkyMind, uh, SkyMind, believe it or not, if you can't tell, is actually named after Skynet. Uh, so there was a lot of companies back in 2014, 2015 that focused on DeepMind, SkyMind, MetaMind, et cetera. We're part of kind of that, that wave of companies. Uh, so SkyMind builds AI infrastructure for companies uh, who may not be able to build it themselves. And we help companies implement best practices for understanding how to scale AI workloads effectively, whether that be on CPU or GPU, uh, and things, like, things of that general nature. So what I'm going to talk about today is focused more around uh, our, kind of our experience in the market and what customers kind of struggle with when thinking about how do I actually deploy AI. Uh, and the reason I'm giving this talk is partially because we only ever think about the math and the latest paper, but we don't actually think about how this stuff is done. And sometimes we, take it, we, we, tr we think we can take advantage of the cloud, but then we realize that, oh, even the cloud is just infrastructure that we have to assemble into something coherent for our use case. Uh, so what I'm going to start with is kind of a brief description of what I'll call the hierarchy of AI. So there are a number of companies uh, out there who kind of think about AI as a buzzword. Some have actually mastered it. Like, you know, they build their own AI tools, their own frameworks, and they know, they know how to use AI effectively. Uh, but it turns out, uh, I will say most companies today are actually not uh, very sophisticated yet. Uh, you know, many, many companies today, you know, barely, barely are able to do basic linear regression, you know, you know, for just basic forecasting, right? And uh, despite all the, you know, despite all the, all the thing, you know, all the information we see about GPUs, the latest deep learning paper, most people don't actually use that stuff in production. Uh, very few people, you know, so it's growing, but, you know, what you're going to find out there in the market is that uh, if people have machine learning at all, uh, they're using regression. Otherwise, it's probably static rules engines. Uh, that's not something people uh, actually acknowledge in the market today. We all want to believe that we're all moving forward and we're all Google. We're really not. Uh, and it's going to take a few years to get there. And so, uh, there, so that being said, uh, we can get there. It's just it takes time. And you, have to, you, you can't tackle it as, a, uh, you know, as one step. It has to be gradual. Because you, you, build, up, you build up software expertise over time. You, in, you acquire data. And then eventually, and, and even if you have data, it's probably stored in 10 different data warehouses. So maybe you need to centralize your data first. You know, so that's the, the, it's just these minor things that we don't think about until it's too late. And so what I'm, what I'm hoping to do is kind of show what, you know, what are these different kinds of tiers of companies and, and, kind, of, and kind of start from, the, from backwards. So like, first of all, what is AI? These companies uh, tend to... Uh, have, you know, maybe, maybe, they, maybe they didn't AI, AI POC, but maybe it's not production, right? I actually see this a lot, especially in Asia. I actually live, for what it's worth, I'm actually fr I actually live in Tokyo, Japan. I don't, I, don't, I don't actually, I'm from San Francisco, but I, don't, I, don't, I, I haven't been back to the U.S. since March. Uh, so I spent, a lot of my views uh, are, I, I would say, from Asia, but that being said, we also have a, a number of American customers as well, and we, we, see, we see varying scales. But this is by far most of the market. They do a basic AI POC, and then they don't move forward at all. Uh, because they don't know, they, they, they question the value, and, or they don't understand, uh, what should I, uh, how, 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 do I get, how do I get ROI out of this? They hire a team of data scientists, and then they don't know what those data scientists do. And so there's a lot of pitfalls around that, because people try to dive in too early, rather than asking ourselves, what should we be doing this with this, with this and what is actually useful? Uh, then next is kind of tier three, you know, so the, these, are, these are companies that have very, some very basic AI, uh, but may, maybe have some basic storage infrastructure in place, but not much else. So, you know, these are kind of, you know, these are the kind of, the, these are the people, that, so, you know, one, one, one mistake I see people making in the market is that they think uh, their dashboard that counts things is AI. And, 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 and when I say AI, in, in this context, uh, I actually want to say machine intelligence. I hate the word artificial intelligence, but I'm using it. I'm kinda, I'll, I'll kind of use both. But think of it as decision-making only, right? Dynamic decision-making with probabilities, right? So when, so when you think about AI, that's what I'm talking about here. Um, so basically, these, these companies, just they think an SQL query is AI. And actually, sometimes what you'll see in the market is that many AI startups define themselves as having AI when in reality, uh, actually, they, they just render some things on a, on, on a screen. They're not actually even do, they're, they're, they might be counting things with an SQL query. 
Oftentimes, it may not even be AI. Uh, you, see that, you see that a lot in the market. Tier two, so I would say this is where most companies should strive to get to, at least. You know, you have, so, so who, who are these companies? They have, you know, they have a modern, they, they at least have basic software, develop, software engineering practices and, and kind of built into the, built into the company's processes. Uh, you know, better, you know, good, good quality assurance, centralized data warehouses. Uh, pro, you know, and, and, you know, another thing I'll say is uh, proper procurement of data. You know, like in the market, sometimes it might take you months to even get data uh, for, your, for your basic machine learning problem. Sometimes there might be regulations in place, especially with things like GDPR now. Uh, so usually companies can navigate this, and usually this is, this is what they should be doing, mo this is what they should be aiming for, right? So it's just something to think about. You don't need to be Google. You don't need to be Tencent, Alibaba. You don't need to be these people. You don't need to build your own deep learning framework. You don't need to, you can use the widely available tools out there in the market. Uh, NVIDIA has helped with a lot of that with their GPUs and CUDA and things of that nature. There's open source frameworks now out there, you know, with TensorFlow, PyTorch, uh, that are widely used in the market. You know, so many of these things are widely available, right? So you don't need to build your own tools, right? Just, just think about that as you're, kind of, just kind of think about that as you're, you're, you're looking at these companies. You probably don't have their scale of problems or their data. Most people don't. Most people aim for this. Like, they, they implement the latest technology, and then they realize, oh, I, oh actually, my, the more basic tech could have solved my problem faster. And usually, what you find is if you use technology from these kinds of companies that they open source, sometimes it, sometimes it, may, not, it may not fit your use case, or you need to customize it. And then you, and then you, you end up needing to understand the technology. Uh, so it's just something to think about as, you're, as, you're, as your company kind of engages with AI, uh, whatever, whatever your stage of maturity may be. So, what I'm going to get into now is kind of the, the components to build AI infrastructure. So there's there you know so when we think about infrastructure there's there's a lot of different there's a lot of different environments, on-prem, hybrid, public cloud. Uh, you know and, and what what we find is that there's you know a, a lot of infrastructure comes down to the same components, networking, hardware, disk. Uh, the cloud is making these things easier, but we still have to understand how these things operate. That's if you take one lesson away from from today's talk, it should be that. Right? Like, so these are the components that uh, data scientists don't think about as much, but really should. For example, if you're doing a distributed job and your job runs out of memory, what happened? Your GPU, you know, if your GPU is maxed out, how do I better, how, how do I better provision my, my machines to handle uh, higher end workloads? Do I need the latest NVIDIA GPU or do I need, or maybe if you're doing inference, maybe you, you know, maybe you need a P4 instead. Maybe you need smaller GPUs with, with faster uplink, right? There's, there's little things to think about in the hardware all the way up to the software. You know, like for example, uh, you know, when you're, you know, one, one, one thing you do in machine learning is something called ex ETL, extract, transform, load. Uh, so that's just when you're loading data from disk and putting it into a usable form for machine, le for machine learning algorithm to consume, right? So sometimes you may need to think about where is your data stored? Uh, you may need to think about networking, et cetera. So you need to think about this whether you're, you know, you're, whether you're doing on-prem or whether you're doing things like cloud or hybrid cloud. Um, so, so when you, when, and even when we're thinking about cloud or you know cloud versus multi-cloud or what have you, uh, what you then find is that uh, you know the, the, these these things have these trade-offs, and usually people are using multiple environments for different use cases, and that's usually depending on you know the the regulations that are that the company is subject to. Sometimes it just depends on where where data already exists. Some people dynamically migrate their, their some some workloads to the cloud. They do they spin up a they they run their jobs and then they then they spin it down. Right? So the cloud allows us to do that today. Some things run on-prem, right? So, but, but again, it, they're, all the same concerns still apply no matter where you're running your workloads. And so here's the typical development life cycle for machine learning, right? So we acquire, you know, we, first we kind of, uh, you know, we define the, you know, so let me think about this. Like, so when you define a problem, right? So what do I mean by that? When you define a problem, you have a wide variety of things to consider. Should I use machine learning? That's the first question you actually should ask. Do I need this at all? Right? And, and, and then from there, you, then you acquire the data for your problem. That might take three months. If your company's bureaucracy is anything like this, it'll probably take three months. You never know. It, it really depends on what, what company you're, you're working at. Um, you know, again, just, just think about those tiers that I mentioned earlier. Then you transform the data. You train your model. You validate it. You rinse and repeat. Right? So we do, this, we, we do this to put models into production and to actually get them used by the company for real value. Uh, some companies just stop at training the model. 
they run experiments, they spent two weeks doing it, and it didn't work. Uh, and and there's, there's nothing wrong with that. That being said, sometimes, sometimes companies don't measure what are we spending, you know, what are our data scientists spending our time on? They don't, some, sometimes you don't, you don't think about that, that side of the workflow. So instead, so from that being said, uh, think, about, think, think about how you can get more models into production uh, rather than trying to think about, oh, what, what experiment should I run next? If you do endless R&D and don't, don't benefit from it, you're just paying people salaries. And it's not really helping the company. So just, just think about that. So moving on, uh, the first component I want to talk about is data storage, right? So, you know, so what, what, what are we thinking about with data storage? You know, all applications depend on some kind of data. You know, like when you're doing machine learning, machine learning itself is actually just pattern recognition over data, right? So if you're doing supervised learning, you may have labels. This is a cat. This is a dog. Uh, this, 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 this house should be this price, right? So machines don't do much by themselves. Even in deep learning today, even, you know, even some of the cool stuff we see with like speech to text and, and all these other things, it decomposes down to the same kind of decision-making framework. You have input data, you have output data, and you have, basically you have outcomes, right? And, you know, and so in this case then, the, the, the source data matters a lot. And so you know, how, long, how, long your how long your training job takes, that's, that, that's directly affected by disk. You know, so like, you know, so storage is cheap, but maybe it's not fast. Maybe, maybe, you're, maybe, maybe your stuff's located in, you know, like an object store or something like S3, right? Um, your, your data may be just on the, on, on the local machine, right? Uh, sometimes, sometimes, sometimes your, sometimes your, uh, your, infra, your hardware may, may not actually even have much storage. Maybe it, maybe it has all power and like one terabyte of disk. That also, I, I, I've, seen, I've seen strange configurations in the market like that. Right? Like, so you have to pay attention to those things, because otherwise, when you run out of disk, uh, it's going to stop your job, and then what do you do next? Infrastructure breaks all the time, partially because of things like storage. Right? And finally, uh, a lot of applications uh, that use storage, uh, usually you have to think about uh, the access latency as well. So, you know, so as, you, you know, as your databases grow over time, you need, you need to run batch jobs and things like that, and then you, you, need, to, you, need, you need to run a query, you need to get the data out, and then you need to put it into and you need to put it into the algorithm, right? So there's all there's all sorts of considerations around storage, like which databases should I use for what problem? That's actually more this is actually more of a software engineering thing. It's not it's not actually even related really to the data science workflow, but a data scientist should understand it. They don't need to manage all this stuff themselves, but they should understand what what data source am I using and is it the right one? And these these are things that that operations teams and IT and IT departments should consider. Networking infrastructure. So, you know, so there, you know, so if you think about networking infrastructure, what, what am I, what am I talking about here? You know, so think about your Wi-Fi. You know, how how fast is how fast is your internet speed, right? Um, you know, so where you know where where is my data living? Is it in you know is it is it in the cloud somewhere, right? Is it okay if it is? Is it in the same region, right? Like so, are the two computers that are talking to each other even in the same region? Are they close to each other? What you find is that some, sometimes you have data in one place, and then, and then you want to run your compute in another region. Sometimes you have to copy data over, right? And so latency is a big factor. If you're going to be doing anything with either distributed training or anything where, anything where two computers have to talk to each other, maybe large-scale batch inference, then you, need to, then you need to think about these things, right? So usually, you know, usually what a lot of people do is they'll, they'll just they, they download it all once, and they, then, they, they, then they put it on their, on, their, on their cluster, right, or on their one big machine. Right? But if you're doing, but even then, if you're doing, say, inference, right, where you're, where you're actually using an AI model as part of an application, then what are your guarantees? What, what is your service level agreement? What do I mean by that? That means I, I, I guarantee that all requests will finish within five to 10 milliseconds, right? Sometimes customers have hard requirements, especially in things like, think, think uh, you know, the, 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 I think the canonical use case people think of is like high frequency trading, right? Like, so there's, there's, high, there's very high uh, requirements for that. Um, but you know your networking can also affect, say, your download speed. You know your download speed of your data, etc. Right? Like so, in general, it affects all parts of your stack. And you know your data center or your cloud has a certain quality of networking, and you should know what it is, and you should know you should know where the data lives, and how that affects and how that affects your workload. So processing. Uh, so so uh, you know one one thing one thing I'd like to point out is that uh, you you know GPUs are getting better. Uh, you know, like I know NVIDIA released their new, they, they, have like a new, they have like a new data science environment they just released, which is kind of cool. Uh, that makes it easier to interop with things like columnar data, uh, pandas, things like that, that, things that data scientists use. 
Uh, that being said, uh, most, ba most basic workloads that people use are probably still running on the CPU, right? Um, you know, especially, I, actually, even in friends, I still, in the, in, in the market, I mainly see, in, I, sometimes it's not worth it to use a GPU. Not everything's a deep learning problem, right? So it, it really depends on, it, th there are trade-offs to think about when, you, when you're thinking about, you know, how you should be processing your data, how, you know, what, where you should be running your jobs, et cetera. Management. So another, another thing people don't think about until, it's, un, until they're hit with a GDPR penalty is governance. How, you know, what, 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 data are we, what data are we using? Where do we get it from? Uh, is, the, is, is the input data pure? Or, it, or, do, or should I be validating that data? Right? Like, so again, as we talked about earlier, uh, your source data matters the most. And sometimes, sometimes data scientists may not always be a part of the process of, of actually understanding where, you know, where, where's my data? How is it used? And is, is the right data being collected? You know, so sometimes, sometimes what I see companies doing is they, they go out and collect a bunch of data, and then they, they spent six months doing that, and then it turns out it was the wrong data. You know, there, there's, there's a lot of common mistakes because people try to jump in too fast. So model training, this is something you, you know, this, this, so this is, this is everybody's favorite part. So model training is where you read the data in, you, you do something, you, you run the process called exploratory data analysis, where you, where you maybe visualize the data. You try to understand, is this input data clean? Is it valid? Uh, does, it, does, it fit, does, it, does it fit my pattern that I'm trying to recognize with my algorithm? Uh, there's a wide variety of things to consider. Data scientists run this all the time. You know, so, so usually visualization is a part of your toolkit, and you should be, you should be using it where you can. Right? And so, so what do you do? After, after you've done that process, then, 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 you, then, you, then you might tune your hyperparameters. Uh, you know, if you, you, or you might, you know, I know some people might use uh, all the new AutoML stuff that's out there now. Um, but either way, you need to build a model. It trains for so many epochs, and you have a, new you have a trained model, and then you validate it. Right? So that's your steps. But, but, then, you know, one, but then one thing you run into is you, you could run into something like a sampling bias. Right? Like, so when you're running a training workload, it may not on, be on all the data, and the data may not be sampled properly. So there's, there's a lot of tricks when it comes to understanding even, like, even, what, even how to train a model, right? Like, so, so, what, so how does that relate to infrastructure? Well, when you download data on your local machine, you know, what, 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 what are you doing? You're, you're collecting all that data, and then that's the data you're going to run your, your training job on. Well, it turns out, did you download the right data? Or is it a representative sample? Or, and, and then from there, right? If it's a distributed job, you know, then, you're, then your networking and everything kind of affects the, you know, the, the outcome of this, right? So again, so think about um, what am I feeding it? How do I tune it? You know, so if you're doing hyperparameter search, uh, that's going to cost you usually, that, that, if you're doing deep learning, that's going to cost you a lot of GPUs, right? Like, so the bulk, of the, the bulk of the GPU compute, say at Google, for example, that, that's actually all, a lot of that is actually just hyperparameter search. So you, you spend a lot of time just finding the right hyperparameters, right? So, you, and so you, you may do this at some large scale or what have you. Or you may just, or you just may, be, may be training random forest. Maybe you, don't need to, maybe you don't need to do very much tuning. It really depends on what your workload is and what, what your algorithm is when you're, when you're thinking about uh, model training. There's different architectures. So you, know, you, might, you might have like multi-GPU systems that are, that, are, that are interconnected to each other. Maybe you're using InfiniBand. Maybe you're using uh, Ethernet. Uh, there's a wide variety of different configurations to consider there. Uh, maybe you're, and then what you might use is like a, a remote file system like HDFS or Gluster. You know, this is, this is very common in, say, HPC workloads, for example. Uh, hybrid cloud, you know, so you might have, you might, you might have your, you might have, you might have your, uh, some of your data on-prem, some of it in the cloud. Uh, maybe, maybe, your, maybe, maybe your data is stored in a little bit of S3, and then it's stored, it's stored you know, it, it might be mixed on-prem as well, right? Like, so, very common. Uh, this is for, this is, this is when you're training, this, this is important for, you know, your batch inference, it's, and it's also important for when you're training your models as well. Um, so GPU training, CPU inference. Again, there, there's, the, the point of this is there's, there's, a bun there's a bunch of different configurations to think of when you're deploying models, right? Like, so what are you, so again, just, just think about this. Like, how is my, how is my application going to be used? Uh, am I building a recommender engine, for example? If you're building a recommender engine, uh, you, may, you, may, you, you may have to do a lot of uh, batch workloads in the background to, to surface the, the recommendations for users. Like, for example, LinkedIn. So when you, when you get recommended friends, what they actually do is they run a batch job every 24 hours that computes all the, near, all, all the, all the recommendations and then serves them from a database, right? So that, 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 that will involve usually some, some form of distributed compute, some of its CPUs, some of its GPUs, right? So there's, there's a lot of common workloads that you should be thinking about, and, and it does relate to your algorithm, 
right? Especially when you start dealing with any, any relevant amount of, any large amount of data. And when I say large, you know, that, that, that could just be something that doesn't fit on your laptop. Um, it, may, it may be something that, uh, you know, it could be petabytes, right? So I've seen, I've seen a wide variety of configurations. So now, so what do we think about with model training then? So, you know, distributed. So this, 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 could be, uh, this could also be, you know, you could replace Spark here with, say, Horovod, for example. Horovod's that new, the new toolkit by, by Uber that does uh, distributed training of, you know, of deep learning models uh, using Keras, TensorFlow, et cetera. Um, you can, you know, what you, so what do you do? You, you split your data up. You decompose the job into, into several tasks, maybe, one in, maybe running one model per machine. And then you're, you're, you're running what you're, you're running here, what you're running here is something called data parallel workloads, right? Like, so you're partitioning your data and you're on, on each replica of a model, you're doing an update and you're doing this, you're doing this, you're doing this for a while across a whole cluster. Uh, batch tra so, so here, here, here's a more complicated example of batch training with Spark where you, where again, you do the same thing. You have a scheduler of some kind, it, 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 it figures out how to partition the tasks. This is, so this, this is what it looks like when you have something like a resource manager. You know, so so a lot of some, something a lot of people don't realize is when you, you you need to schedule things on a cluster, you're probably sharing that cluster. So so what does that mean exactly? You know, you you might be scheduling things on maybe your maybe your company has a total of ten GPUs, and what you know what you know one thing I find is that you know people people aren't using those GPUs effectively. So and, and that, that affects their training time. That affects and that, that just affects the data scientist productivity, right? Like so again so again just just think about how your data is partitioned, um, who has access to what cluster. And understand that a resource scheduler is in there somewhere, and that your that your data will be need to be you, you will need to know how many resources you need, and you you will need to par partition that data across machines. Uh, there's also so this this is a way to think about batch training. You know, so if you're if you're going to be doing distributed training like this, you might do like a rob, round robin approach. There, there's there's a wide variety of ways to to partition your data, but this is actually this is actually where batch size becomes interesting. Batch size becomes a new parameter that you didn't have to think about that you that you may, maybe you thought about in terms of Training time, but maybe maybe now you need to think about it in terms of networking as well, right? Like so, this this is kind of the math you do when you when you want to break up a batch in, into pieces. So like you have a batch size of four out of 2016 data samples, and you have three executors, right? So data parallel is actually just your you know the, the mini batch training you're used to, where you train on one batch at a time on one computer. Now you're doing now instead you're doing it now you're instead you're doing it across multiple replicas, and you you kind of rotate the data across different different parts of your cluster. You know, so you might, and then what you find is that you know, if you're doing if you're doing any kind of distributed compute, you know, you will usually you usually find not not like a perfect linear speed up, but usually like a sub sublinear. It depends on whether you're using Horovod, Spark, or or whatever whatever distributed training framework you want to use. So model deployment inference, you know, so what do you have? An application, REST APIs, wide variety of different kinds of plugins, etc. This is this is these are all the things that consume that you use every day. Right? So th this is what your company wants to hook machine learning up to. Your mobile phone, your software plugins, your web applications, your dashboards. Or maybe, may, you know, so it depends on how you consume machine learning. There's a lot of different kinds of use cases. But when you're doing inference, it's all the same. You're usually connecting, you're usually connecting to something via REST API, or, or may, maybe, maybe you're using gRPC or, or something like that to connect to the application as well. Most of, what, most of what I see is you put a model in a Docker container, you stand it up, and expose it as a REST API somehow. That's what most people do. And then there's a wide variety of serving frameworks out there today as well. Uh, so this this is this is something like this is this this is an overview of what 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 that what that looks like typically. You know, you might have like you might have some some form of centralized infrastructure. You might have model you might have models you're running. You might have your distributed compute. You have a wide variety of databases, and then you have different chips that you might be running on. You know, it's like we you know we run workloads on IBM you know on ARM. We run it on Intel. We're running it on Nvidia, AMD, etc. Right? Like so. So this, this, this is kind of an overview of the, all the infrastructure, right? Like, so the applications you saw right there are all up in the corner, right? And then that connects to the rest, that connects to the rest of your infrastructure. You know, so different, different companies have, have done different parts of this uh, better than others. For example, N Netflix, for example, has a uh, really sophisticated notebook infrastructure, right? Like, so that, that allows them to, to run and track experiments very effectively. Sometimes there are just whole companies that, do, that focus on just the, the, you know, kind of this tracking part. Right. So again, just just think about uh, just think about the, the larger application as you're as you're kind of building your models. You know, so when you're doing deployments, uh, you know, you know, some some something something sometimes what people will do if they're at least they're doing it right, 
is you'll, you're, you make models kind of like, you, you think a model is kind of like a, a component of your continuous integration work, actually. So continuous integration is where you repeatedly, where you, you basically you hit push on your, your, your Git, you know, your, your source code, and you run, you run your build, and you get the output from the model, right? Uh, so you should think of model deployment as, as, just as, as, a new, as a new extension of that, where you stand up your infrastructure, you use the models, and, and, and you access them kind of like a portfolio. Um, so, you know, so if you want to think about if you want to think of them about things a little bit differently, think about which models you're using. Some companies will have five models. Some will have thousands. How well is that model doing? What is it? You know, what is it doing in production? Is it is it losing accuracy over time? You know, so for example, you know, so wh why would you want to think about this? Say you're doing fraud detection, and you have and you're you're retraining new models every day for because the fraudsters keep moving. You know, they keep changing their 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 patterns, right? Well, so how 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 would you keep up with them? Via, via, making model, via making model deployment uh, a first-class citizen in your, in your workflows. So again, uh, you know, there's different kinds of inference, real-time, REST, transactional, transforms. You know, so, so sometimes people run batch job. You might have just a batch job server. You run your job, and then you, 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 get, the, you get the clean output. You know, this, is, this, is the, this, is the part, this is the part I mentioned about ETL earlier. It's called vectorization. You take your data. You, must, you, you clean it up, and then you, you basically you save it as something like a NumPy array, like some form of a matrix. Um, sometimes you might have, you know, if you're doing recommenders, you might have something like k-nearest neighbors or, uh, you know, or, or, whatever, or whatever your favorite matrix factorization algorithm is, et cetera. Uh, deployment again, uh, batch inference. So this is where you're running. This is kind of like distributed training. But in this case, all you're doing is you're, you're just saying, I have one million new data points. I want to run them as a job. Store the and then store the results in a database, right? So this is your this is again your typical uh, this is again a very typical workflow that people do, you know, especially when you're doing some form of business intelligence. This is kind of what it looks like. Again, same thing. You know, you you have something that launches your Spark application, and then it and then again you you schedule your job. It finishes at a certain time. You consume the results in your application. Uh, so asynchronous. So, so another, another, another pattern that people use, might, might use is something like Apache Kafka. Uh, so if you want to do, so for example, you might have a model as a, you know, as a, what, what we call a consumer of this publish subscribe pattern. You publish, you publish some data, and the model, the model consumes it, and then you send the results off somewhere. So asynchronous workloads, uh, another variant of this is actually the actor pattern. So that's, 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 where, that's where you just pass around data as a message. And then the, the, model, the, model does it, you know, the model does its scoring and then sends it off to, to, to wherever your, your next workflow is. Uh, so this is, this is kind of what it would look like in, you know, with, with Kafka, but you could use RabbitMQ here. You could use really any kind of PubSub infrastructure. Uh, so sorry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go a little fast here just so we can get to questions. Um, so again, PubSub attached to a model server, as I mentioned earlier. Again, so just, this, just, think, just think of data. Data is streaming is coming in, right? So data, data comes in all the time. New orders come in, new, and you have end users. That data goes somewhere. You need to do some, you know, you need to, you need to act on it, right? And you need to act on it continuously. So this, this, is, this, is, this is one way you may do that. Management. So you have a bunch of Python scripts. You put it into a platform, right? Like, so this is, this is what a lot more people are starting to do. They actually track and revision all their parameters. The reason they do this is because a lot of people are wondering, what happened to that m model I had that was more accurate last week? Where did that go? Uh, a, lot of, a lot of data scientists, they, they usually have their own workflows for this. Uh, you know, every, everybody tr tends to write their own tracking code somehow. Uh, this, 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 this is just how they get things done. Like, what model was more accurate when? What assumptions did I make? You know, the, you know as part of your analytic, you know, as, as, as part of doing this, you need to think about what, what is the best way, what is the best implementation of this? You, you know, even just when you're doing research, you're going to see a lot of this. So when you're thinking about model management, there's a job system, a history server, and deployment, right? You know, so this is the so the job system is where you schedule jobs. The history server is where you're doing all your tracking, right? Like so so what what is this? You know what what did this model do when? Uh, what 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 models were used at what time on what users? And again, deployment, right? So this is this is where this is where everything's kind of managed and tracked for you. So this is kind of where this is what this is kind of what model management looks like. You have your servers, you have your databases, etc. And then, and, then, and, then, and then your scripts are kind of the client that calls into this, this infrastructure. And then again, just, and then, so again, the takeaway there is think about models as a portfolio, right? You know, so 
you know, so, you know, so what, do you, what do you get from that? Everything's managed. You can track your accuracy over time, and you can figure out, and, and you can catch things, uh, you know, like what, like what I was saying earlier, like, like, like uh, you, know, de you know, drift. So data drift, right, where your, your input domain changes over time, and your models get less accurate, right? Like, so that's really common when you're, when you're doing any form of machine learning in production. Performance. So you have different kinds of so you have different kinds of chips. You need to think about whether you're doing distributed training or not, uh, or whether you're or whether you're going to run on one big machine. Uh, another thing is different kinds of chips. So you know, for example, like one one thing people don't realize about GPUs, for example, is in order to make GPUs fast, you need to act, oh yeah. So I'll just I'll finish up on this one last point then. Uh, so with GPUs, right, you need to you accumulate batches of data because GPU because GPU GPU transfer while it is getting better with things like NVLink. Uh, you, you still need, if, if, you're, if you're streaming in small amounts of data, you're not actually going to get benefits out of a GPU. It's just something to think about when you're, when you're kind of thinking about how do I use my models and am I, am I getting the most of my, out of my hardware? All right. And with that, I will, and with that, I think I'll end. Uh, so, I'll, so I think for now I'll take questions. Thank you. ね、時間関係上、저희가ピピティスライドの最後に補充できなかったので、質問の質問の質問の質問の質問の質問の質問の質問の質問の質問の質問の質問の質問の質問の質問の質問の質問の質問の質問の質問の質問の質問の質問の